Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, best-selling author and your host on Inspire Nation. Check out our website where we'll be posting podcasts, tips, videos, blogs, and more at inspirenationshow.com. Today we have a guest whose work has greatly influenced me in his life. His name is Dr. Michael Merzenich, he's PhD. He is the author of Softwired, How the New Science of Brain Plasticity Can Change Your Life. Dr. Michael Merzenich is a professor emeritus at the University of California at San Francisco, a member of both the National Academies of Science and the Institute of Medicine, and the co-founder of the Scientific Learning and Posit Science. Often called the father of brain plasticity, he's one of the scientists responsible for our current understanding of brain change across the lifespan. For myself personally, he's helped me understand how others can heal after severe injuries, how they can adapt and change, and how we can use our environment, exercises, and challenges to help our brains grow smarter, stronger, and more resilient at any age. He's also one of those paradigm busters, helping us understand that you can stay sharp or even get smarter, no matter your age or circumstance, and no matter if you've had a brain injury, there is still hope. And that's fantastic news for our veterans, as according to Dr. Merzenich's book, one out of three out of the two million returning vets have a TBI or traumatic brain injury challenge. Today we'll be talking about getting smarter, training the mind, staying sharp, and having the healthiest, happiest minds that we can. I think that's important whether we're thinking about ourselves, our kids, or our parents as they age. Whew, that's a lot for the brain to think about. <laughs> well, welcome to the show, Mike. Are you ready to shine? Absolutely, Michael. Woohoo! <laughs> 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 well, thank you so much for joining me. Yes, you've been a longtime friend. You've been a guide for us. And it's been really fantastic to bounce ideas back and forth because neither one of us seems to accept the paradigm that we're stuck as we are. Yeah, you're a paradigm buster yourself, Michael. <laughs> just, I'm really happy to be here with you. So, well, thank you. So I, I was reading through your book and as you were, as you were a kid, you were called an applied philosopher. Yeah, well, that was my that was my notion as a kid. You know, as a young man, I I was interested in the in in philosophy, the great issues of life, like mm -hmm. most young people are, and <laughs> I, I I decided to study this not in the arguments of philosophy, you could say, but by by trying to understand the complex processes that account for our for our natures by studying it in the flesh and blood of the brain. So that, that led me to neuroscience, to being a, a different form of nerd, <laughs> a biological science nerd, studying the brain and its, and its, uh, and its wonders. So you'd say- So you'd that's how I spent my life, Michael. As a brain geek then? Pardon? As a brain geek. That's it, exactly, <laughs> brain geek. <laughs> so so you've, you've, you've been called the father of brain plasticity. And uh, uh, I wonder if you can both share what is brain plasticity, and then after that, maybe the experiment that sent you on this path. Well, a lot of a lot of scientists have contributed to brain plasticity and our understanding. The brain is continuously plastic, and that's another way of saying it changes. It's altered by our experiences physically and functionally. We tend to think of it as something that sits there, resides like a computer in, the, in our skull, but actually it's continually revising itself, continually remodeling itself as a function of how we use it. And in fact, every time we acquire an ability or improve at anything, mm -hmm. we're actually changing our physical and functional brain. It's its great trick. It's, a, it's the, it's the one, most wonderful thing that it does. It alters itself for the better, or I might say for the worse, well, as I a think, function of how we engage it in life. I think that's something that, you know, if, if you've gone anywhere down the rabbit hole in self-improvement, in self-help, in motivational speakers, you hear that a thought creates a thing. And that literally your neurons wire together or hardwire as you're thinking. So what you're saying is they're hired, they can hardwire together, they can also come apart, but that's con it's a continuous ebb and flow. It's never static. Absolutely. It can go north or it can go south. You know, it can go backward or you can go forward. And we understand increasingly how to move it forward, you could say, as it relates to our abilities or as it could contribute to recovering ability or strengthening ourselves at any point in life under any circumstance. And really, Michael, it's all about choosing forward. So this is, this is uh, choosing forward sounds good, but it's so, this is such a deep 
We all grew up thinking, not all of us, but if we were thinking about the brain, we were told that what you have develops as a kid. In fact, in your book, you talk about people saying that right. it, it, it was done by age one, and then it's this all grand downhill slide from there. Right. And you're saying that's not the case. Nothing could be further from the truth. Woo-hoo! Actually, <laughs> yeah, we're 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 an incomplete pro- project. You could say at any every, every stage of life. Mm-hmm. At any stage of life, we can we can turn on the jets and grow again. At any stage of life, we are sub- we're always subject to improvement. We're subject to continuous improvement. So one of the great changes in our understanding of our neurology in the last thirty years is the understanding that the brain is continuously plastic. You know, people at any age can acquire a new ability or improve at any ability. And we know now, unequivocally, that that's accounted for by brain change. Brain so, change for the better. So when somebody says, I'm too old to learn that, I'm too old to change, I can't think that way anymore, or that's something that you can learn because you're younger, but I can't do it. Right. They should slap themselves alongside the head. Oh no. <laughs> and, get, and get over that because it's just not true. You, you everyone is subject to improvement and everyone can be stronger, better, more capable next week as opposed to this week, next month as opposed to next month. And you think of those those accumulative positive changes in your neurology, right? And mm-hmm. what they can mean over a year, over 5 years if you just set yourself to this form of self-improvement. So you know, you it's us, a great gift that we do not want to squander, Michael. Can you give us an example of of maybe somebody who maybe was even in this category who then flipped the on switch? Well, hundreds of people have, have communicated with us who've used the sort of training assisted tools that we've developed to try to help people. And they tell us about how their life has been changed. But, you know, we know many, many people in history who've, who've turned their life on a dime because they are renewed in their energy or they reconstructed how their life should be organized and suddenly they do things they never imagined that they could do before. We, we get all kinds of reports about from people, maybe someone that's struggling in life in their job and they're, mm-hmm. they just can't get ahead, they can't pass some critical exam so that they can continue in their profession and then or some challenge and then they train their brain, they engage their brain to change positively and their life is rejuvenated, it's renewed, it opens up. They're the boss. They're suddenly succeeding on a high level. We, we hear these reports over and over again, Michael. I, I love that because what it implies, and, and when we first met, you were telling me about a rat study and rats that were close to death. And right. you actually made it, the poor rats, you made it more difficult for them to get food rather than easier. And they ended up getting smarter and living longer. <laughs> yeah, Michael, if, if one of the aspects of our plastic brain is a brain doesn't change mm-hmm. unless it matters to it. Mm. You know, it's got to matter to the rat. It's got to mean something. Well, when right? you want to get dinner, that matters. If you've always got dinner without <laughs> effort, why change anything? That, well, but that's a problem. But if it requires effort then things have to change, and they do change under the right conditions. That's a problem, because in today's society, we want things easier and easier and easier. Like we've talked about before, we want to get rid of the crack in the sidewalk. Yeah, absolutely, Michael. What we want to do is operate as if we could live life without a brain. And you're right about living life with a, without a crack in the sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> We've even, we even put sidewalks now out in the countryside so that when people walk in the park, they don't have to move off the pavement, Michael. I mean, that's how silly we are. So talking about that, we talk about brain plasticity, brain growing stronger. We go and we make things easier for people. What is that doing? What's that doing to our mind? Well, the, one of the reasons we do that is because we don't have to use our brain, you could say, to control things like the unpredictable movements in the body. Mm-hmm. So we can do other things like mind wander, which is what we do. <laughs> you know, we're out there sort of adrift in a semi-conscious state, not p- really paying attention to anything. It takes us off the beam. You know, what we need to be is connected to the world around us, to mm-hmm. its details, to its wonders, to the smells and vision and the, and the sounds that are occurring, the, that the birds are making, and so forth. But you know, if you go to any park in America and watch people walk through it on the paved path, by the way, on the paved path, <laughs> you see that most people are not engaged, or many people are not engaged, even there. And this is not healthy for us. You know, it's, it's depriving us 
of a heavy schedule of, of, of exercise for our brains to maintain our operations at a high level as receivers and interpreters of information. In essence, would you say that it's getting us, for lack of a better term, fuzzy brained because we don't have to tune in the channel all the way? Uh, exactly. And, 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 and this, is, this, is, this plagues us in life because it's contributing to memory loss, it's contributing to operational losses in our ability to reason, to come to solutions, to problems we face. In all kinds of ways, when you turn when you turn up the noise in the machine, you degrade its operations in all of the things that matter to us. Specifically, noise meaning noise meaning uh, all of that chatter that's mm -hmm. occurring in the brain that's meaningless ah. because we're not engaging the brain to maintain its operations in high fidelity. So, would you say mindfulness exercises, being bringing it back to that present moment, would yeah, it? It's, Exercises themselves, engaging the brain, have to be mindful. We have to be engaged. Uh, again, I said before, mm -hmm. if, if, if it doesn't matter to you, nothing will change for the better. And, and mindful, being mindful is another way of saying you're connected to it. You're connected to what you're looking at, to what you're seeing, to what you're... What you're, what you're, you're, you're focused, you're concentrated in your approach to it. It matters to you. You feel the weight of it. So I'm thinking if, if like, uh, I'm thinking about my parents or my in-laws, um, to have something that matters, you need, you need to have a purpose at any age. Right, absolutely. You, you need that carrot dangling in front of you or else I go into my day-to-day -day humdrum routine and then right. things start to get fuzzy. Yeah. Now, we've actually created training strategies to help people basically recover their status. We don't believe it to be the end all of what they do. We think, you know, you have to live life right, too. Mm -hmm. I try to emphasize in this book, but we actually created strategies that are delivered by computer. But what they do by computer is they control your level of attention or engagement to the tasks that you're on. Nothing is ever easily masterable. In fact, nothing is ever really mastered because when you get better, things get harder. Mm -hmm. And as they get harder, the whole idea is to ratchet up your abilities, minute by minute, hour by hour. So it's like, a, it's like a video game that keeps on getting tougher and tougher and tougher, yeah. um, or, or, or in life, just trying to, well, you talk about this in the book. You talk about when you get to a level of mastery, like learning to ride a bicycle, then, you, then your brain wants to go and try to ride without hands, and then it's, it would try to want to do yeah. whatever's next. Yeah. Yeah, or an alternative in life would be mm -hmm. to start, your brain can celebrate and say, well, I've got this down. This is as good as I ne ever need to be at this. And fundamentally, the machinery of the brain goes on automatic pilot. You know, and you don't want to go, you don't want to roll into automatic pilot. The whole idea is to continue to improve your faculties. And you can improve them. You know, you can improve them on, a, on almost any dimension. You do not have to stop. So in, use, in working to improve your faculties. We use the analogy before the crack of the sidewalk, something we've talked about before with, with uh, barefoot running and barefoot walking, and how the right. crack actually makes a challenge, and the more challenging, right. the better it is for the mind. So in a sense, yep. are you suggesting that we need to, uh, particularly as we get into a rut, a routine, shake things up? Absolutely. Load that sidewalk with cracks and get them deeper. <laughs> throw throw, throw a few it. boulders in, Michael. <laughs> throw in a few rocks. <laughs> Let's have a few grass yard, glass yards on the sidewalk. Oh, my no, God. No, I absolutely <laughs> need it. And, and a big part of this, Michael, as you and I have talked about a lot, you, you want the brain is basically um, marvelous at dealing with the unexpected, with, with dealing with the surprise, dealing with the unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And it's making the adjustments when something occurs. It's learning the rules of adjustment when something occurs that's not expected. That is that that's brain food. And, you know, we, we try to drive all of this out of our lives by making things so darn predictable. Oh, there are cars and, now. There, there, there are cars that, that literally have a um, cruise control now that can sense how far you are from the vehicle in front of you. <laughs> so you can really zone out. <laughs> yeah, right. No, no. And this is reaching a level of absurdity, but still we accept it and adopt it in our life. And, and it, it's wonderful. You know, it's mm -hmm. wonderful to imagine that a car will drive itself. You know, just like we are in a sense now already driving ourselves by living in environments that are so simplified. Mm -hmm. We never have to think about walking so in, a, in a normal urban environment or in our houses. So we you know, really need a, is, every, 
<laughs> we need a saber tooth tiger. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. It's like, in a sense, hunting with the massive gun against an animal that can't move. You know, <laughs> it's a silly way to live a life. You know, life is not meant to be without its intellectual, cognitive, perceptual, or emotional challenges, of course. But it's all about social vibrancy. It's all about a vibrant life in which we're engaged with the things around us in our actions and in our perceptions and in our, in our decision making, in our operations. I had a, you, you talk about a, a gentleman in your book who um, at 100 was driving around or probably is still driving around the nursing home vehicle. Uh, yeah. our, our best man at our wedding was uh, 89 years young and uh, he was driving around the nursing home vehicle um, for the, the youngsters in their 70s and 80s um, right. and, yeah. until he was 93 himself. Right. So. Yeah. This engagement. Yeah, I talked about another friend of mine who is at, who's uh, now approaching his 100th birthday. Yeah. He's a chemist. And when he was 95 or 6 years old, he invented a strategy to make sugar sweeter. <laughs> so that by making a t tiny mo modification of the, of the sucrose molecule, that the sugar tastes twice as sweet. He did this at his 96, in his 96th year on the planet. And he did that because he has a brain that is is continuously growing. Well, he's still he inquisitive. Did, he did not. He did not choose, at, in a sense, at some later time to take it easy to say life is over. I'm gonna I'm gonna rest and smell the roses now. He he engaged in life with vibrancy. What's with the difference? Vibrancy. What's the difference then between him and somebody else? Was it going after his passion, or was it not knowing that he couldn't keep doing this? Well, I think in his case, because he came from an era in which uh, most people around him were mm -hmm. basically were basically going off the rails, he was he was so excited about what he was doing in life, and and he's a man that's full of life. You know, he's a man that was always engaged physically and functionally and intellectually, and in his occupation, always thrilled by get to get up in the morning. You know, and so should we all. I mean, we should be engaged by life and live it and breathe it every day and make the most of it and make the most of, the, of, of our potential to continue to grow. So Not to accept the fact that we're old and therefore our destiny is supposed to go rapidly downhill. I'm thinking even somebody in their 30s or 40s who we don't realize if we're playing it safe. Now, we're taking our traditional path, and the traditional path has really been blown out of the water. But, right. yeah. <laughs> but, but you're, 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 you're punching your clock, you're doing the 9 to 5, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But if you're not careful, you're actually setting yourself up for a rapid decline later on. That's probably, sure. correct me if I'm wrong, it's starting then as we're getting into that rut. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, think of what we're doing. I mean, Michael, you're sitting on that chair. Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> it's on a chair. <laughs> sits on their keister for yep. 10, 11 hours every day. Yeah. Now, what kind of a movement control ex related exercise is that? I mean, how are you controlling your actions there? I mean, you're moving your little arms and your fingers like little robots in front of you, <laughs> right? I mean, really. Uh, well, I'm remembering uh, back to a talk people with... Have, people have knee problems, people have back problems. Oh, I wonder where that comes from. I remember a talk with, with Dr. Merzenich uh, um, uh, years ago when he was saying that we even learn our best when we're moving. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. No. Or we sit in that chair and we watch a screen in front of us. Mm -hmm. And the screen has limited dimensions. Uh, maybe it's a real little screen or maybe it's a giant screen. Yep. But everything interesting happens in that screen. Everything outside of it is irrelevant. So why is it, do you think, that in our older life, people see less and less in front of them? Pretty soon they only see things that are more or less directly in front of their eyes. Ooh. When when you're when you're 80 years old, the average American sees half as much in across the horizon in front of them that they see when they're 40. Why oh, is no. that? Could that possibly have something to do with the fact that they're spending six or seven or or eight hours every day looking at a little screen? So you're and saying of course it does. It. And of course, <laughs> what we do needs to be compensated by changing the other aspects of our life. Even if we're going to do that, I mean, I, I don't recommend spending that much time looking at screens if you can help it. But 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 if you can't get past that, spend the rest of your life opening up that vision to the wider world. 
in doing things that actually engage you with the wider world so that you open up what you see in the world from ear to ear. Who would choose to live life seeing half as much in front of them no, for, no. for a good part of their life? It would be a foolish thing. Yeah. So don't do it. <laughs> All right, so then let's jump into, let's, let's dive into kids here. And um, actually, we're getting a little feedback. Is there a way to turn down the, the uh, uh, sound on your end just a tiny bit? I can try that. All right. Hear me all right still? Yeah. Okay, excellent. So that our audience isn't hearing the booming voice of God coming from Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Jessica always likes me to ask a question about kids, uh, kids, infants, uh, the young people coming into this world. And they're coming into this world with brains that have an amazing ability to wire. In fact, it, it, you talk about it. Um, this is the initial time of massive brain growth. And then we go and we put a, uh, <laughs> a cell phone, a PDA, something in front of them, right. which we talk about our, our, we have maybe two kinds, you can say it's more than that, of intelligence now. We have our intelligence inside of ourselves. We also have our social intelligence, which come from generation before and generation before. And maybe those, that technology is a piece of that, so is it okay we're giving them that technology now, or should we hold off on that for a while as their brains are developing? No, it's a great question, Michael. And, it, and of course, it's complex because there's some things about this that are just marvelous. The mm -hmm. fact that child child has so much information, access to information, and they do have marvelous interactive progressive games to play that, are, that have a value. But, but, but they have also all sorts, in a sense, they have all sorts of consequent deprivation. So how much time is the average child spending outside, connected with the things of the physical world? I mean, cert surely much. there are losses. There are losses from that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I know a child psychologist in Israel who's been studying the the way that children learn the rules of human operations. Mm -hmm. and it turns out that a new problem is emerging in child populations in Israel. A lot of children don't know the rules. They don't know about human interaction and give and take and other things because they spend so much time in the artificial world of the device. And, and when you play wow. a game on a, on a, on a computer, yeah. you, you're playing a game that has rules. One of the ways I, I describe this uh, problem is many autistic children that are severely impaired mm -hmm. can master computer games. But they stand up and turn rules. around and they're still autistic. What's different about the real world? The real world is full of unpredictability. It's full of surprises. It's full of a level of complexity that does not apply in its social complexity, in its physical complexity, mm -hmm. to a constructed world of a game. And so computer worlds, game worlds, are not real worlds. And real worlds have to be lived in. And a person has to learn how to operate within them as a kid, of course. You need to be in nature. A child needs to be in nature. They need to move in nature to, to develop a neurology, the neurology that they were designed to exploit as an adult human. So, and we, we've talked about this in great detail before. I mean, we grew up hunters, gatherers. We grew up moving through nature, through our environment, right. and that helped us build our wiring. An environment that was continually unpredictable. You know, where's the next surprise going to come from? You know, I mean, it was all about it was all about discovering and identifying all of those sources of those surprises occurring in every mode, in every way. You know, and uh, the brain needs these these things. It needs to operate, to learn how to operate with these sort of more continuously complex challenges that are occurring in the real world. So instead of playing it safe for our kids, we need to give them, we need to give them some, well, yeah, definitely some life challenges. We need to make things complex and not so much dangerous, but uh, throw them out there a little bit. Well, I, I wonder, you know, again, there, there are wonderful things that have happened. You can mm -hmm. say positive things. So what you can really yes. say about a child's brain now is that it's different. I can see it in my grandchildren. You know, I have wonderful, four wonderful grandchildren. I can see my grandchildren, my, my grandchild Gus, who's eight years old now, is a wonderful individual, but he's, he's sort of computer mad. 
<laughs> and his brain is definitely different from mine. I love him. I love what he is becoming as a little human being. But there's no question that he's nature deprived. There's just no question. He's outdoor deprived. Mm -hmm. He's game. He's he's physical game play, play deprived. He's not spending enough time in his bare feet on the bare ground. He's not doing enough things that connect him to the physical world. And yet he's doing a lot of things that are empowering him. Yeah. He's a worthwhile kid. Believe me, I love him. He's a great kid. But he's different. And and a, and a lot of those differences I think are not strongly supportive of of neurological powers. So in other words, it can it can give him a life for instance that is whew, this tiny little vision straight in front yeah. of him. Right. And that could be a, a real challenge later on. Yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. And I mean, there's no question that it's both empowering and limiting. Yeah. Do you see? Why not have both, Michael? Why not have the resources of a modern yeah. environment, and and take the empowering part, and add to them the the the, the, the sort of classical resources of a, of a more physical life, of a more engaged life? I think that's absolutely possible in a child. Give an example. Well, why not? Why not try to try to uh, balance the child's life mm -hmm. between this and that? I'm for that. I'm for I'm for insisting that the child develop a life in the outdoors and connected with nature and connected with the things of the physical. <laughs> and 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 I'm for doing that rather aggressively. Now, at the same time, the child can be aggressively connected to devices and can be mm -hmm. learn to master them, to learn to operate in the modern world facility, but not spending all their time sitting in front of the box or sitting in front of this of, of the tiny screen. So then, and so I just think these things need to be balanced, and that there needs to be a sort of an aggressive attention to actually living a life in. in and the, the second part of this, Michael, is is that, to my mind, in a modern society, we're way too way too strongly in the process of c c controlling and supervising children in their development. Children need to operate as, as open human beings solving complex problems at a relatively young age. And they do not need nearly so much supervision as we provide to them. You know, I mean, a child should be allowed to do things on their own. I, the I did. I went and gave a talk a few years back uh, at a school system just outside of D.C., uh, very well-to-do school system. And there was a sign in the playground as I was going inside to give, give this talk, empowering youth, and it said, no running in the playground. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't want kids getting hurt. <laughs> what, a, what a beautiful example. <laughs> and, and we know already the playground is a paved, you know, sort oh, of, of sterile <laughs> environment that is horrid by its construction. And, and yet, even there... Don't dare run! What a silly, what a what a strange world we live in. <laughs> it is, but we we are the we are the makers of the strangeness. So I'm thinking back to kids, and I'm thinking about for everybody listening to the show, what what do we need to do differently ourselves? And and we are the models for our kids. We so are. If we want our kids to get outside and do stuff, and right. we're the ones saying we need to provide for our kids. Therefore, I need to be at the job. I need to just sit at my desk. Um, there's a there's a real gap and kids are brilliant modelers <laughs> yeah they are they are yeah yeah right and, and you know mom and dad come home tired from sitting in front of a screen all day long and they sit down and sit in a screen all night long <laughs> you know, that's, oh, not, no. that's, not, that's not the best model <laughs> so what so do we do we, are, we all suffer from these problems of so these these conflicts of what's really best for us yes what and, what's, and, and, and these things we slide into because of the, and in fact, we're designed to slide into them. You know, the way our societies, our culture is constructed is, is that, is are these things are supposed to suck us in and, uh, and attach us to, it, to us like leeches, you know, to, to it like leeches. And, we, and we, we are sucked in by it and we are attracted to it, of course. But uh, we have to argue against that because for the benefit of our neurology, we have to live life in a richer form. So average person watching this 30 40 50 years of age and we're going you know I feel like my brain isn't quite as sharp as it was yesterday right. Um, right. I can speak personally in, in working on the show I'm, I'm reading five or six books a week I've never been sharper 
as far as absorbing information, but my short-term memory over the years is just getting fuzzier and fuzzier right, and right. fuzzier. So what do we do? How do we begin to make these changes? Well, one of the things that we've done is to create, to create exercises that are computer-based. And again, this is using technology to solve problems that are substantially generated by technology. But we've mm -hmm. created computer-controlled exercises because there we can drive changes neurologically that are enduring and, 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 and strong relatively rapidly with relatively high efficiency. So we have, this, we have a, a brain training site called Brain HQ, which you, you know about, Michael. Mm -hmm. Where, we, where we've trained many, many, many thousands of people in ways that improve there. And we've demonstrated scientifically in large control trials that we do, in fact, drive these changes in their neurology and in, and in their ability. So almost anyone can engage in exercises like this and change their capabilities. Now, of course, there are also things you can do in real life that will improve your abilities. One Such of the as. things that I... Well, I talk about these 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 pro pro progressive activities that you can engage in with two main objectives. Okay. The first main objective is to grow the machinery in your brain, to re-strengthen the machinery in your brain that controls the way your brain changes itself. So it turns out that the machinery that controls the plasticity or the capacity to change your brain is itself plastic. And one of the things that happens mm -hmm. in an older individual is it slowly deteriorates as well. So stop, stopping you for a quick second, if just to translate this, if I'm getting it right, which is the ability to strengthen the brain can be strengthened itself. Exactly. Exactly. Now it turns out that a large, this is largely controlled by processes that are engaged by our dealing with the unexpected, to dealing with things that command our the attentional moment. Mm -hmm. And we actually deliver such exercises by computer. When we train a person on a computer, the first thing we do is we train them to be keen and alert and really on the ball to the attentional moment. But there are a lot of things you can do in life that will improve your ability to operate in the intentional moment. So to cite a very simple example, if I'm yes. out in the woods and I'm really into bird watching, yep. it's all about attending to the attentional moment. What's, where, where hey, you know, where's, what is, <laughs> you know. It's all about it. And so there are a lot of things you can do in real life. I can play ping pong, mm -hmm. and I'm in a sense responding in the intentional moment to where I must be in the next second on the base of what I just saw in front of me in a flash. There are a lot of things I can do that can improve my ability to operate in the intentional moment. And when I do that, I'm really strengthening the machinery of the brain. It sounds that's like... That's controlling change itself. It sounds like these things need to be... I don't know if reactive is the right word because the ball is coming back you and reactive right. has a pactive, passive aspect to it. But there is a reactive aspect, sort of like we're jumping from danger or something. We need right. to constantly be adapting and moving and changing. Right. If, if, if I looked in the scene in front of me mm -hmm. and I could say, well, what's happening in it that's just a little bit different than it was the second before? Yep. And I'm pretty alert to that. And, and so that's, I'm here waving off in the corner. <laughs> that's a sign. That's a sign that, that I'm improving this faculty. Mm -hmm. now, now, I'm also, I also have to improve the machinery that controls the rewarding to my brain. And, I, and I, I can improve that aspect of it by doing things that I get better at that are valuable to me. So that could be anything. You know, for example, Michael, yes. I do jigsaw puzzles. You say, well, why would anybody do a jigsaw puzzle when they're when in the modern world? Well, I do them because it's rewarding to me. <laughs> if it wasn't rewarding to me, I wouldn't do it, right? And I and actually, it's a challenge to me. I'm better at it now than I was a year ago. I'm a lot better at it than I was two or three years ago. I'm not. I'm not satisfied with being as the the same old jigsaw puzzle player you know i was five years ago right i love it and every time i get a piece i'm happy so you know <laughs> in a sense i'm exercising the machine now yep. the best way to exercise this machinery is by giving a reward to somebody Ooh. so it turns out that when i gain pleasure by being generous mm -hmm. by being kind mm -hmm. by doing somebody a favor that matt really matters to me I'm exercising the same machinery that rewards me when I get it right. And and from what I understand, there's even more brain chemistry going on that you can't get by helping yourself that you get when helping others. Absolutely. So, you know, you want to feed your brain? Smile at the person you pass on the street. Oh, wow. Say, yeah. <laughs> what a shock, right? You know, I mean, be a, be a, be a deliverer mm -hmm. of, of kindness and good news in the world. Mm-hmm.
Just make that a part of your life. Now that's that's part number one. Part number two is is that you have to refine the way your brain is receiving information and challenging conditions from your body as you move. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. As things move in front of you, as you move across the, the world, absolutely. This is why walking, running, paying attention to what you're seeing and dealing and feeling matters. On a bike, I don't care how, you, how you're how you in movement. Get in motion. And get in motion in ways that you're really listening and feeling the body, paying attention to your feelings, and also paying attention to what you're seeing, smelling, what you're hearing in the environment in front of you as you're moving. So that's, a, richer, that's, a richer environment, the headphones right. off, Right. Something that's more both rewarding and, for lack of right. another term, not not uh, adrenaline junkie, but right. a little bit of a uh, you have to pay attention factor to you, it. You got it. And then in our brain exercise, of course, in the computer at Brain HQ, we drive you forward as fast mm-hmm. as we can to improve your basic faculties. But if you think of that in your natural life, think of all of the things you might enjoy doing that will be progressively more and more demanding if you move to a higher and higher level. That could be something like, uh, hey, I'm finally going to get a little better at playing the piano or my guitar. Yeah. It could be, well, you know, I've I've uh, I've enjoyed playing tennis, but why not, why not become a tennis master, mm. right? Or whatever. It doesn't really matter what it is. You know, it can be anything that that is progressively more demanding, cognitively or physically. And the the best kind of thing is something that's both physical and cognitive. Something that's that's what playing a, mu- a musical instrument is all about, or singing. It it mm-hmm. it's definitely has an intellectual side, but it also has a physical side. I love and that. And you're never gonna be you're never gonna be you're never gonna be a great operatic tenor, but you can always be better. When uh, there was a show, it was like a PBS show. It was uh, a Japanese show on centurions, if I'm pronouncing that right, centurions, centurions. And uh, it had these people that uh, there was one gentleman, I think, at 95 or 96, yeah. and he was he was almost completely out of it, drooling. And uh, his folks got him, wa- or his folks, his kids got him walking, and then got him running, and then he set like a, a world record in the 60 meter dash at 101. <laughs> And then these others who went on to do similar accomplishments by learning language yeah. in their 80s and 90s and challenge themselves to learn a new language, learn a right. new skill. Right, which most people would deny would be possible, which is, which is not, nutty. It is possible. Mm-hmm. The brain is plastic until you die. It, you can't kill this ability. You cannot kill it. The only way you can kill it is, is by leaving this mortal coil. It is with, it's your great trick. So, you know, Michael, one of the things that frustrates me is, is that most people are unaware they have the greatest, one of the greatest human gifts they have. Mm-hmm. And that's the capacity to be better and stronger. They, they imagine that they're always, when things are slipping a little, they imagine that they're on the path down to their d- doom. Why is it so important at, at any age I'm going along well, things are going fine. Why do I need to worry about my brain now? Well, it's because the progression, the, the, it is a slow path, a long, slow slide, mm-hmm. and it all matters. You know, to maintain your abilities, of course, at any time you could go into intensive training. That's one of the reasons we created these computer-based programs is because we knew a lot of people needed to advance a long way to their for the sake of their health. Mm-hmm to save themselves uh, in, in a relatively short time with high efficiency. So that's what Brain HQ was about. It was about helping people save themselves. It, but if you did something like that, uh, even on a lighter schedule, if you engage your brain continuously on a lighter schedule, if you change your life to the, to the advantage of your brain at an earlier life, you don't have to worry about this. You know, you don't have to look forward to an almost certain life, uh, ending your life in the home. And that's what you're trying to, what you're trying to make the most out of life. I mean, my feeling about it is we have a certain limited span on the planet. Yes. And why would you squander that? So what you're saying at its, at its core, because this is, this is big for people, is that we don't have to, what is it, 50% of people get, get Alzheimer's? Maybe the numbers? Well, uh, you, by the time you reach your 80, if you live to be 80, most yep. people think they'll live to be 80, you know, it's, it's approaching 50-50. So, and you're saying it doesn't have to be that way? No. 
you can absolutely maintain yourself in, in better stead. You can absolutely change the trajectory of your life mm -hmm. by engaging yourself in an earlier stage and sustaining yourself. And I mean, we're, this is not a certainty, yeah. but it's highly probable that you can delay and perhaps prevent altogether your passage into this t terrible end state. That's one of the, but I mean, it's not just about that, Mike. It's not just about preventing the disaster at the end of your life. <laughs> it's about living life to the fullest. I mean, yes. <laughs> really, it's about turning the lights up and living life, you know, to the best of your great, your great human advantage. It's about making the most of it. And something we can do now. So uh, on on that note, um, I'm thinking about our environments because right. Je Jesse and I have have. We've gone over everything that you said has 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 sunk to a deep level. You'd you'd think I was insane watching me brush my teeth or do my antics in the bathroom because I'm thinking about you all the time on some level because I'm shaving with the opposite hand to, <laughs> to try to work on wiring there. When I brush my teeth now, and I came up with for for my coaching clients, um, I came up with a whole bunch of exercises, what I call toothbrush exercises. Engage your core, hold yourself in position, gotcha. and now I'm brushing my teeth with my eyes closed on one leg because <laughs> I want to constantly challenge and I'm challenging the vestibular system doing that. So I look at our environment, we think of, of Dr. Merzenich and we go, you know, it'd be great if we had rocks that we had to climb over in our living rooms. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, you know, we do so much to beat the, the, any demands and the variability of our actions out, out, of, out of life. What a mistake. You know what I mean? The reality is, is that that you know when we learn to move, we mm -hmm. learn to move to deal with the incredible variability that occurs in a natural environment. That's that's what we're designed to do. We're designed to deal with the unpredictable and all kinds of. We don't move anyone in any for any one action. Take a step in a, in the identical way until we basically learn to turn it into a bad habit. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, what you really want to do is to continue to move to operate with cognitive and with physical movement elaboration. It's about maintaining your ability to move in any which way, at any speed. It's about, it's about elaborating your neurological capacities and abilities and sustaining them in an elaborate form. What happens when you get older? You go into the senior shuffle. You go into the ability to be able to lift your hand all the way up to your waist. You know, <laughs> you, you go, you go, you're going to get out of your chair, right? I mean, it's all about sustaining elaborate actions, not just in your, as they relate to control of your body, but as they relate to the control of your thoughts and your mind. You talk about in the book negative learning. And, yeah. and I think this is something we all fall into. What can you share about that briefly? Right. Well, it's just really easy to, to, to get into a negative mode. So, so I, I give you a simple example. A person is older and they fall. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, uh, I, I, I better be really careful how I walk. And uh, maybe they fall again, and then they're really worried. So they say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to walk now in a more regimented way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, uh, to watch my feet, and I'm going to control my stepping. Yeah. So uh, they also commonly flex their, the, the, the legs at the hip a little bit so that if they do start to fall, they can react more rapidly. Mm -hmm. Well, everything they do is, is absolutely destructive. So by regimenting their step, it means they can't deal with the pebble in the road, which is why they fall, right? So by looking backwards. at their feet, it means that if they start to fall, things are going to move past them at high speed, yep. and they're sure to fall. They're going to bring their eyes are going to bring them right down to the ground. It's fascinating. And, by, well, that's and then like, by flexing their hip, it means that to walk, they have to keep the tent, the flexors and the extensors, the muscles on both sides of the legs, in contraction, mm -hmm. and they're going to get tired in about two minutes. And, and that's going to increase the probability of falling. The main thing that increases the probability of falling is having a fall and, and developing negative habits around it. It's what you think about is what you're going to bring about. I'm afraid yeah. of falling and therefore oh, I'm going to fall. It's you adjust your behavior without knowledge of your neurology and the mm -hmm. consequences is it gets worse. And, but it's, it's called ne it's negative plasticity. Mm -hmm. You're changing the brain for the worse. So let's talk real briefly, uh, and then we'll start to wrap things up here. Um, you mentioned in the book briefly about what's called a third brain and a third world. And, right. and on this show, a lot of people are, are either meditating or aspiring to meditate, or at least right. trying to quiet their minds a little bit. Right. So what can you tell us about this? 
Well, I talk about the second world, just so people know, is the world of your body. Because we think of the world we construct in our brain as the world out in front of us, you know, mm -hmm. that world we see and smell and, and, and hear things from. But also we construct a world that is a reconstruction of our body and, its, and our organs and our movements and all those things. But the third world is a world inside. It's a world of emotion and feeling, thought, the way we label things, the way we, and we, that we substantially control, you could say, with the internal operations of our brain. And we have the power to grow these abilities. You know, I mean, the Dalai Lama mm -hmm. has grown empathy in his brain. There's no question about it. You know, if you talk to him for about five seconds, you realize <laughs> it's in there in a big form. But I've had the privilege of talking to him a couple times. And it's, it's, it, you go away and say, wow, he did that by progressive mental exercise. So you don't think of mental exercise, you could say, yeah. as as having driving plastic changes in your brain. But of course it does. It drives them just as much as does controlling your actions in the world. So whether I improve in the way I can control my hand as I yeah. operate in some way in using my hand in my job, or whether I control practice in controlling my thoughts. As I practice problem solving, I'm changing my brain physically and functionally. I'm changing it plastically. So it's not just about exercising it by, the, by interacting with the things outside, but also by operating on it, by practicing those things inside. That's powerful. Your empathy, I recommend it. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I love you. I love everything. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, it's such a great pleasure to talk to you again. It's just a real, real, real thrill for me. And I, because I think that you're one of those people that's trying to change the world. And I sure hope you get do it a little faster, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> uh, for the better. It needs changing for the better. Thank you. So what are what are three takeaway pieces of advice you would give for people uh, working on their brains? Well, first of all, live life as if you have a brain. You know, <laughs> you know I mean, don't find all of the ways, all of these strategies that you can use so that you don't need one. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, uh, uh, if you can turn off the GPS, you know, you can probably actually figure out <laughs> and certainly turn it off when you're moving out across the mountain. Get out in the world. Mm -hmm. Smell it. Mm -hmm. Feel it. Look at it again. Use your your senses. Use your use your 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 intellectual energies to really try to understand and 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 and, and, and enjoy it. And then exercise yourself as a matter of habit in ways that advantage your brain. If you need to go to the computer and use exercises at Brain HQ, do that. They work. But. Also, change your life so that you exercise your brain in life. You know, get out there and use your brain in ways that matter to it, that will change it for the better. And your brain will thank you, Michael. It will thank you. As you know, your brain has thanked you. You know it. It certainly has. I think that's two. Do we have a third one? Oh, that was three. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not letting you get through. Although, I'm going to segue. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a brief tangent and well, say, and say, is there... Are there foods that better fuel the brain? Of course, all of these things matter. All of these things matter. You know, your your your, your brain needs brain food, of course. <laughs> and 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 these things these things will make make a difference. Many people need to calm the brain down. They need to basically control again through mental exercises. They need to control the levels of their anxiety. Another mm -hmm. brain poison, just like you say, brain food, mm -hmm. is a life of high stress and anxiety. You got that in there. It's bad for you. Calm down. Exercise your brain. Look inward. Slow it down. Smell the roses again, inside as well as outside. I love it. All right, one final wrap-up question, a question we ask all of our guests, which is what brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the woohoo factor? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I just enjoy life, but there's no life I enjoy more than the life with my with my own children with my wife with my family being somewhere where we're in the world which we are which is such a pleasure for us to live in mm -hmm. to have this place on this planet with all its wonders with our fellow with our fellow members of those people that are closest to us it's living in their love and affection with love and affection to them and to the 
to the world around us that I enjoy the most. Beautiful words and a, a, a beautiful way to live. Yeah, well, why not? It's free. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us on the show. It is it is always my pleasure. I'm so humbled and honored to speak with you as always, Mike. Uh, it's so, really nice to talk to you again, Michael, and I hope we see each other somewhere soon. Love it. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, exercise that brain, <laughs> and shine bright. Okay. Woohoo! <laughs> Take care, Michael. Thank you, Mike. Hi, Take everyone. Care. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>